Hey everybody, welcome to the Kurt Johansson Show, it's Kurt, and today I'm looking into the all-star wrestling run, as well as, well, he started off on the Finland scene as well, Eccentrico, thank you for coming on. Thank you very much for having me, it's a real pleasure to be here and I'm a huge fan of the show. Oh no, that, it's always quite surreal when people in the business like, yeah, I'm a fan of your show, and I'm like, ah, behave, and then when we start talking, they're just like, oh yeah, in this interview you talked about this, it's always quite... Um, surreal, so it does mean a lot that you've checked at least a couple of the episodes out, so thanks for that. Oh, definitely, and big shout out for Kian Kelly first for putting me on, on the, because uh, it, it was his interview that made me want to start listening to the podcast, and I really enjoyed it. Oh, brilliant. Uh, well, it was Kian that was like, you need to reach out to him, and um, I know it's been like a long time coming, but we we'll finally made it happen. Uh, you've been recovering from the knee surgery, I've just become a dad, so... How's things you're in in regards of the surgery recovery? Oh, the surgery recovery is going really well. Like, it, well, I even have to remind myself at times that, like, hey, you're still recovering from surgery. You can't go 100 miles per hour because right now I feel like I could go back in the ring and start wrestling. But I know, like, the, anybody who's got any medical experience or anybody who's had ACL surgery would be like, no, this is the worst time to go right now because it's at its weakest. But at the same time, I feel great and it's already been feeling like I've been gone for so long this is literally the longest I've been without wrestling since 2014 I mean it's obviously for everybody else but even in addition to the uh, knee surgery yeah well I know it's it's never nice to be injured or never nice to need surgery but if there was that time to have it it is now um, because you're not really you're not missing out on any of the shows and I know we were speaking before we went on the air it's like well what if, if I'm out for this long in te- whilst wrestling's running who's going to take my place are they going to step up to where I'm no longer needed so um, what's your thoughts process on all that well I'm st- like we mentioned before the show as well like I'm always kind of like worrying about my spot like I still feel like I'm the same kid who came through All Stars on the summer of 2014 just <laughs> a guy who didn't know wrist from wristwatch but even though like you, you had like guys telling me like, oh, you need to get, be, get in contact with me, tell my story. It's surreal to me as well when people in the job say like, oh, you, you like you know the job, you you're well enough. So to be away for this long, like I, I think we've all got a little bit of like nervousness between us. Like, do I still remember how to do things? But I'm pretty sure it's gonna be like riding the bike. Yeah, it would be um, like any injury comeback. I think when you take that first like major bump or where you push yourself a little bit and you're okay that'll be when you're okay like I, I always remember when um I did my MCL on my left leg and luckily didn't need surgery um but it was I was out for a while I was on crutches for a little bit and then I think it was a couple of weeks in my knee still wasn't great and I tore the ligaments and tendons in my ankle on my right leg and I probably came back a little bit too early where one of, one of the players was like, should you be playing? Because even in the warm-up when I'm jumping up for the, like, just to stretch out and stuff like that, I was unsure which foot to, like, which leg to land on. I was like, well, I don't want to do my knee, but I don't want to do my ankle either. Um, and I know sometimes your passion can get in the way of your recovery. So I think that's where you're kind of lucky as well that you can't rush yourself back because this pandemic's, like, stopping the wrestling, so it's stopping you from doing that. Yeah, and l- luckily for me, this is not my first rodeo. Like, o- almost 10 years ago, I had the exact same injury on my other other knee. And with that one, I had the ACL re- reconstruction as well. But I came in a little bit too early because my meniscus had also a little bit of tear. And almost as soon as I had a comeback, I had to go for an- another recovery, uh, another surgery, sorry. But luckily this time, I'm, I'm not only am I more mature, but like I know it's like just take your time. It's gonna be fine. You're not yeah. gonna be rushing, but you just have to like 
keep reminding yourself just okay take it easy take it easy and i know like when it when i eventually do get back in in wrestling like i think that'll be my like comfort zone that'll be like the safe zone where i feel the most comfortable it was just like like the little thing like we're doing physio we were doing like this little test on like how the legs recovering i was doing like one legged hops and measuring like both legs which like like is is it like within like 30 centimeters of each other and just to do that <laughs> jump on one leg was so scary when yep. considering that all the things I've done without having an ACL inside my knee, and I've just been wrestling, wrestling, and wrestling. So it's weird, like those everyday things are scary, but with wrestling, it just feels it's going to be easy. Not easy, but more comfortable. Yeah, because it was uh, the surgery, it was for the ACL reconstruction and medial meniscus repair, wasn't it? Uh, it was it was scheduled to be a medial meniscus repair, but it, it turned out to be a partial meniscectomy because the meniscus was torn away. They couldn't actually repair it. Okay. So they just took the little bits bits out of it. So how did you do it? Because I know, again, you was wrestling for about a year before doing this surgery. Like you said, you've had the surgery and you're worried about doing one hop. But before the surgery, you was wrestling without it. Like, do you remember when that when the injury occurred? I definitely do. It was uh, it was either April or May in 2019 in Bradford Broken Ring Wrestling. And it's one of those, you know, as rest, I'm pretty sure every wrestler is going to be listening to this knows that you can do all the crazy stuff, but it's the little things you've done a thousand times that are going to hurt you. So I remember I was in a three-way match with, um, it was Wing Commander Nash and, terrible with names, uh, she, she was a Priscilla Queen of the Ring, and she had me in a backhammer. And I just do I like like I always done like like I said a thousand times, did a little shoulder roll into like a kip up landed on my leg and just a bit basic reversal that I've been doing as long as I can remember. But for whatever reason this time, as I was jumping in the air, I started turning in mid air to go into like instead of landing and then turning and reversing the back hammer. But I started turning mid air, landed on my like all of my what 220 pounds on my leg, twisting popped and I knew it. He was going straight away and i was like okay something's wrong i can't walk i can't put any any, any uh, weight on it and that that was basically it. Uh, but still i was like yeah it, i probably just twisted it. it's gonna be fine so i didn't go to the doctors i had two bookings the next day uh, i just put a load loads of tape on i just bought a heavy new brace and i just kept on going because i was like oh, it'll be fine i'll just have to change my wrestling style it, it just I was. I kept telling myself the only reason it's not healing because I'm constantly working. So when the yeah. lockdown happened, I still didn't go to a doctor's because like, oh, I'm just gonna have some time off. I'm just gonna have some time off. But then when it did, and it's like, oh, okay, maybe it's time to uh, go see a doctor. And wouldn't you know, tore an ACL again. <laughs> what did they say like when they're asking how you did it, and you're like, uh, I probably did it about a year ago, but I've still been wrestling. Well, that's pretty much the like. It was the same thing that happened when I had my first ACL uh, surgery. I told the, re- the doctor, it can't be that bad. I've been wrestling. And I rem- well, this was over the phone, and the doctor was very nice. He was just like, yeah, that hasn't been very smart. You should have, like, if, if from what you described, the fact that you didn't come to the doctors is a ridiculously stupid thing to do. And uh, <laughs> you, you could have, like, completely t- destroyed your knee and never walk again properly. So... I think it's just my own stubbornness and just like the I've instilled on my brain that like the uh, no quit attitude, like you know the old school mentality. You know, you you work hard, you just tape up and keep keep going. Yeah, definitely, and I think that's where with the um, the crowd and the adrenaline aspect when you start feeling off that crowd. I think that's why it's it's like not many other things can do that. Like I don't think there's many other sports where you could have a bl- essentially a blown out knee and still go do the physicality stuff that you was doing but again do you think it was the adrenaline that was helping you get through i think it was definitely the adrenaline because it was usually like i never noticed my knee was actually bad until like let's say in the car journey afterwards you know we crammed yeah. up in a small car and and uh i think what like really like also helped me is just the fact that i've been like with with all stars you've been working camps so you kind of yeah. like learn to wrestle in different environments so you have to like learn to adjust your style 
And so as soon as I realized, okay, I can't do this, I can't do that. So I was able to alter my style in a way that like I was able to protect myself and work around the injury. Yeah. Even a simple thing is instead of, because I'm completely right, right legged and right handed. So I just had to start using my left leg for like most of the kicks and everything. Because if I tried to do anything with my right, my left leg, which is not the bad leg, it would just give out and it would just, there's been a few instances in like in the ring, like, okay, something happened, like obviously because I've missed the ligament, so I've twisted it, I felt it loose. I had a little jolt of pain, but I would just tell myself, tell the referee, tell her, okay, just give me a second, I'll be right back in it. And then five seconds later, we're back to running the ropes yeah. and doing all this st- stupid stuff that I should not <laughs> be doing. Like kids, like if there's any young wrestlers listening to this podcast, don't do what I do. If you feel you're injured, take time off, go see a doctor, get insured, go just don't, don't, you don't have to prove yourself to anybody. You don't have to think, oh, I'm a heart man. Like this is what they did in the old days, brother. So just <laughs> get yourself checked out. Look after yourself. You're the most important tool you have. Yeah, definitely. And well, you mentioned like changing your style, obviously with the mask and you've got that Mexican, the Lucha Libre style um, of wrestling. Did you did you change that style during that period? Was you trying to do maybe a more grounded uh, British style? Uh, definitely yes. I've noticed because like there was like certain maneuvers you'd have to base off with your like left leg jump into them. So it wasn't the fact that I was worried about landing or hitting it. It was just the fact that I couldn't like jump off my own leg. But also over the years there's been like a slow change this kind of like rap made it a bit more rapid because i realized that i'm six foot one i'm 220 there's no need for me to be constantly because i i can't do a back I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll be the first i'm the i'm the one luchador who doesn't do moonsaults so i figured like i'll use this as an excuse to build up like become a little bit heavier and have like that unique aesthetic of colorful outfits but also a bit more built physique and then yeah. doing a bit more a traditional style because even with Mexican wrestling like Lucha Libre and British wrestling it's a lot of submission based wrestling like the high flyingness obviously there is a little bit of uh, expectations from the crowd but especially like when you know kids see the mask they expect oh he's going to do all this Rey Mysterio stuff uh, as long as I do a 619 and I dive across I think everybody goes home happy and yeah being a more heavier guy that I am already, I'd, I've also like slowly started to move away from like head scissors and all these kinds of maneuvers. I could do them, but then I would almost, almost like <laughs> I've wrestled Kate, uh, this guy called Ken Lay uh, 300 times at least. And I've, I've seen you you'd promoted on Facebook that year in uh, triple digits with Caden Lay. Probably closer to like almost four digits probably, but like the fact is, because he's a big, heavier guy, and I could do all these like headsets with him. But every time I watch the videos, you could see like my head would just like be an inch off the map because just the size difference. Because yeah. he's what, five ten and I'm six one, so just even for my, for my own safety, I've started to slowly move away from certain maneuvers. Could we ever see you wrestle without the mask? Do you think, or are you gonna still keep that mask? as part of it because like you mentioned with the kids they see the mask and they're like oh he's going to be doing flips he's going to be Rey Mysterio and as you're trying to bring back that high flying style and go to the more the traditional like ground based work would you consider the mask or do you think that's who you are? I think with wrestling never say never like there definitely I, I wouldn't turn it down I, yeah. I mean the mask is something like it, I almost feel naked without it these days and like when people like because right now in the interview those who are watching video i've got like an open mask but those of you who haven't seen me in my quote unquote i'm doing finger quotes i don't know why i'm doing <laughs> the podcast but i'm doing finger quotes and i'm doing uh my real mask is a full mask so people are like how can you breathe in breathe in that thing it's well with the pandemic has shown like it's easy to breathe in one of those masks but yeah. for me i think Definitely, there would like there will probably be a time. I would like to be. I mean, for me, it would be nostalgic, like one of those like Lucha de Puestas, like mask versus mask or mask versus hair. Like I would like it to be a bit special when I finally like officially come out. Like okay, this is me. This is without the mask. But at the same time, I'm not in any rush because I, for me, one of the most rewarding things in wrestling is just 
not I'm, I don't do it for like the fame or the admiration, but the fact of I can like inspire kids the way I was when I first saw like one my first memory in wrestling was seeing Rey Mysterio dive off a cage on SmackDown yeah. on I think 2002 or something like that, and that gave me like a huge boost and a motivation, and to give younger kids and younger families that same kind of reaction, and also the same kind of mentality what, that I had as a kid because you couldn't see who's behind the mask. So it would be easy to picture that, oh, it could be me. I could be that kid, like guy in the mask. Cause like, no, and nobody would know the difference. Being a comic book fan as well, having the secret identity was uh, something that appealed to me. Yeah. And as a masked wrestler, when we do like shows and they have like, I'm in, in the British scene, I, I found like I'm the only one who sells actual replicas of my masks. Yeah. So when the kids come in, like everybody who's who's done family shows, they know that masks is a big market, and they have those Sincara, those Rey Mysterio yeah. masks. But when they like, oh, they just buy one of my masks, they think, like, oh, that's a mask, that's cool. But then when they actually see the guy come out who has the same mask that you do, it really like I, when when I'm doing my entrance, I can see they're like turning to a Paris. Oh, look, look, it's the same guy. Yeah. So. I don't know, like, I would never have masks of my own face made because I look like Gollum. But uh, definitely, like, I'm not, like I said, never say never. One of these days, it, it is going to happen more than likely. If nothing else, for my very last match, whenever that happens. Yeah. Okay, so if you were to do the, like, hair vest mask or whatever, what opponent would you want to share that moment with then? Uh, that's one of those dream match scenarios. Uh, well, for nostalgia's sake, it probably ha- would be Caden Laid because we've been best friends for the past five years. Yeah. Uh, definitely could be Dino because after all these years, like Dean has been a huge influence for me and a huge help for me and all the time we spend on the road being good friends. But we've never actually had a singles match. So. Oh, shit. Yeah, like we've done tag matches. We've done three ways. We've done like different matches. But one-on-one, I have never faced Dean Olmark. So maybe that would be like a little just for myself. I haven't yeah. really thought about for who would be my ideal partner, for, but I would think that what, whoever would be the best for business, basically. Like, I don't think I, me, myself, maybe not be the biggest draw at the moment, but if there was somebody who would like have a famous hair or a famous mask, whoever like, I could do help for the promoters who've been giving me up opportunity. I know it would have to probably be with all-star wrestling or yeah. first class wrestling which is basically a like a lot of like guys from all-star also working on first class wrestling and it all it feels very special to me yeah yeah it needs to be in front of i guess the um people close to you but also the fans that have been used to seeing you quite a lot mm, definitely um so, where that would be, I don't know at the moment. I haven't really thought about it. <laughs> I am shocked that you've not been one on one with Dean, though. You you would think that, like you know, me like Eccentrico versus Dean Olmark would would have happened at some point, but for whatever reason, it just never has. I mean, there was a little bit of talk it might be happening in one of the shows, but then the lockdown happened. <laughs> so that's one of my like I've like I've wrestled. Everybody in the All Stars, I've wrestled everybody from Dean's school. It's just he's the one guy who's always eluded me. <laughs> There's a conspiracy there. He must be trying to duck you for some reason. Oh, I mean, obviously he doesn't want to wrestle me because he knows I'll get a better reaction than him. So he goes to Brian and says like, "Hey, I don't want to wrestle except for that." <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> and for I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a DM from that one. But I'm, I'm going to like, <laughs> he'll know I'm just joking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um so like taking it back to the beginning i know obviously you started off in the finland scene and um it's a series that i've been doing is like the hashtag scandy graps where i've been looking in sweden norway denmark and i've got a couple from finland lined up but again you, you're the first and you was there before the scene really started growing because I, I feel like it's a lot bigger than what it would have been when you was working there full time um would you agree from what um, you've seen? Def- definitely. Like, it was like, because I left, I moved to England in 2014, late 2014. And I think, like, that's when, like, the seeds were slowly being planted. Yeah. But, like, uh, ever since I left, I don't, like, this is more, more their territory and I don't want to go into too much into backstage politics or anything. But, 
like there has been a shift in like management and all this and i i, I still like keeping tabs on like watching yeah and i feel like it's doing a lot better than it did when i was like go, when i was stepping like when, we know when you're in the bubble you don't really realize but now stepping back and having all this experience from around around uk and seeing like how things quote again finger quotes for those who are listening how things should be done like i yeah. realized there was a reason why like finnish wrestling wasn't booming the way it should have with all the like the talent and the presentation like the tools were there they were just weren't utilized properly but now i'm really happy for them the way they're like doing massively like even today today we're recording i know they're doing like i think they're doing like a web show or something like that like they are having a show today i'm really yeah. happy for all the hard work is finally starting to pay off yeah definitely um was it Starbuck and Starcada that you'd trained under? Yeah, they were my first trainers. It was mostly Starcader, uh, yeah. who I still feel like I, I consider him to be my primary trainer. Um, but Starbuck did also weigh in on with his experience because obviously he, he, for those of you who don't know, he was basically the guy who started the whole Finnish scene. Yeah. So everybody in Finland is basically a product of Starbuck because he trained the trainers who are now training. And and the trainers who train the trainers again. Yeah, definitely. So what was it like? What's the best bit of um, like advice, and what did you learn from both of them then? Um, like this, the with with Starbuck, he was always, I he kind of like instilled like he's very old school, and he kind of instilled the value of like the hard work. Like this is not for everybody. This isn't ballet. Like you have to be pushing yourself. You have to be like physically in top condition you have to be make like he was the first guy who kind of like made, made it made me realize how important just the fact like uh perception is reality in wrestling like yeah. if you if you look like a star people will assume you're a star and that's how i got my foot in the door with all star for instance just the fact that i had a decent outfit on and with star gather who's he just this calm and collectedness that like not getting phased Obviously, as a young teen and new in wrestling, I was going way too fast. Yeah. But he would always know how to like just slow down. Just from the way he was behaving himself, he would just like okay, just be calm and collected. Oh, brilliant! And um, cause was the it was mainly obviously Finland with FCF that he was working. Was you working for Smash as well, or was Smash not around at the point? Uh, is that in which country? Uh, Finland. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, of course. I, I, that's that's uh, Starbucks' new company. No, that, I, yeah. that the reason I asked you because uh, there used to be Smash TV. Finland had a few episodes of uh, FCF. Used to have a few episodes okay. of Smash TV, but Smash Wrestling Promotion. I think they started in 2018 or 2019. So I've not been a part of that one. Okay. Um, well, I know from your um, time in, I believe it was Finland, the El Generico match. It was, I want to say, 2011 or 2012. And uh, that's what, like, my silly claims to fame in wrestling whenever Sami, Sami Zayn was wrestling and he had those, <laughs> all, the, all those countries in his flag. I was the guy who made Finland possible. I, I helped him there. And that was a very interesting experience as well, even though for those of you who know Finnish uh, landscape, it, the funny thing about that match was it was called, held in a town called Porvo which is not a very big town. So the mm. fact that we went outside of Helsinki thinking, oh, he's going to help draw the crowd there. But then Finland is kind of like the same attitude you have in, uh, like, versus all-star wrestling like that. Yeah. You, like, the general public don't really know who you are, so you have to make yourself the star in the situation. So unfortunately, even though he drew some wrestling fans there who definitely would not have come to that show, so, but he was still not the glorious superstar match in like in the big hall in the front of the sellout crowd that I was hoping it would be but at the same time kind of in like silver line in the day because I was not ready for that match either <laughs> how like how do you feel the match went for yourself then uh well going back and like if I, I like that's I wouldn't say regrets too strong of work but that's definitely I would like to have a do-over with my current experience yeah I think the biggest problem at the moment at that time i was just too nervous too starstruck without like thinking like hey he like nowadays i've just realized he's he's one of us he's just yeah. like everybody we're all equal we're just working there together to give the best possible show to people so i think i was just 
too nervous and going too fast. And also there was a difference in like the styles that I wasn't ready for. Yeah. And also in a sense of like there was more like what like on the fly wrestling, which at the t- for obvious reasons because of like the time restrictions and like him like being away and like just the way like he doesn't have time to like practice every single match which I had more of being accustomed to yeah definitely um because I know you'd you'd worked the uh Danish and Swedish scene as well for I think like Svensk GBG and Dansk Pro what was it like for you at that point in your career then to be going to these other countries um to wrestle uh, I was absolutely loving it. Like, uh, like the thing with Finland is problematically. Like, the only problem is the, the geographical location. So you have yeah. to like fly everywhere. Like, for instance, like in Germany, you can just pack up people in a car and drive. But to be able to like travel to a different country, go on my own, and just because of wrestling, that was like the dream come true to me. Like, I could not have believed that, like this could be happening to me. I was so ecstatic and. When you mentioned uh, GBG in Gothenburg or Yetebori, as they say, or in Malmö, the SWS, like I'm sure other guys in this uh, Scandigrab series will say the Swedish crowds are incredible. Like it, that was just uh, like a holy, holy poop experience for me as well. Just like how, because Finnish people are a lot more quiet and like we don't like to react, like we're naturally shy, there's all this. So to go to like a country where it's the complete opposite and they just go like even just doing a headlock takeover and they just go, yeah, it was just an amazing experience. And I really wish to go back there one day. Yeah, I'd spoken to um, Sixt and Alice Inc and Marcus of Man of like the Swedish scene. And they was just saying like how the more the 18 overs crowds are a lot like what people would expect from like some of the more rowdy crowds here in the UK. And um, it's good to see that the scene is live and it's booming, I guess, like it's, it's growing and stuff like that. Um, one thing I'd been asking like all those guests as well was like a, uh, like a Scandi Grab super show, I guess, where they try and sh- just showcase how good, people from Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark are and try and do like a series of shows to try and unite and things like that. So that'd be like the perfect homecoming for yourself, I think, for the Finland tour, um, for you to go back. And who would you want to face if you used to go back, though, for that one big match? Who would I want to face? Uh, well... Unfortunately, a few of the guys back home from Finland, like they aren't active as, as well. Yeah. Uh, but I would think Starkadder would be just for the fact that like he was my first ever match. Yeah. So to so to have that nostalgia and going against them. Also, I just like anybody from Sweden. Everybody I've met, Steinbold, Harley Race, and all those guys, they've all been so just great, and they we've been, they've been here as well over in yeah. England. So it'd be just nice to have like. Because we've had them here on a quote unquote our environment in the camps, so to have them in their hometown when it's comp- when it's their world and their style of wrestling, um, I haven't given that much thought. Like I'm, I know I'm a bit biased for like you know the Finnish guys. I would love to work one somebody from yeah. Finland as well, just for the fact of you know nostalgia. But just to be a part of like this like Nordic countries coming together and do one super show. Even if I would just be like a guest ring ring announcer, or just ring the bell, or if nothing else, just work the camcorder. Like that would be. I just want to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, hopefully, I can mention in that many different interviews and with different promoters, and it'll happen. Like every, everybody, I'm like, right, this needs to happen, and everybody that I've spoke to seems quite upbeat about the possible idea. So hopefully, when wrestling can go back to normal, they can put the egos aside and try and work out what would work best for business but try and make something happen because I think it is a scene that does need more appreciation and hopefully then start seeing more guys coming over here like yourself um, That wh- when was it that you moved over to the UK? So it was November 14th 2014 when I officially moved here. I had my first experience here in the UK that summer of 2014, I was invited to do the camps with uh, Brian Dixon and All Star Wrestling. Wow. 
Would it have been after those camps that you went to Israel? Uh, it was, yeah, because I had just moved to uh, UK in 2014 and it was just in December 2014. I went for a three-day visit there. What was the wrestling scene in Israel like? Uh, it was, uh, I don't know what I was expecting, but it was, <laughs> at the same time, it was, like, I could see a lot of similarities in, like, Finland, like, because it's, it's, like, it's just people who love wrestling, who want to do it, like, themselves and just get together and put the shows together, get a ring and just start promoting. Like, you could see, like, they were what Finland was maybe yeah. 13 years ago. Uh, but the fact that the guys were so passionate about it was just, like, really... Uh, almost like it made me feel ashamed in a sense like these guys are <laughs> so like they've they kept saying like you know obviously the, the, the customs are everything just the fact that they got a ring there yeah I, I don't ask me why they got the ring for because i can't remember but the fact that like they made that happen and they what they were saying as well like with the culture there being a little bit different so they were a little bit like people are a bit more hesitant to just you know go see a wrestling show yeah. but they were so passionate about it and they just wanted to put put this thing together like it was it wasn't about like making a million dollars or like making massive profits for it. it was for them just to like the wrestlers and the crew to just have this own moment of like this is our community this is our family and this is us doing the thing we love and it was really intoxicating almost yeah i can imagine so how did your first tour with all star come about then uh, well, a guy from Finland uh, who I assume you, you, it was definitely worth having on your show as well called, yeah. well, as English person, in England he's called Heimo the Wild Man. Okay. Like, how you Heimo Ukonselka, like this guy with like, this beard and face and long hair, because he's been around a lot of, in the European scene. And I think it was one of the guys there, just like how he, here's Brian Dixon's email. And so he went for, to work weekend for All Stars. And then when he came back, I, I was being eager and I was asking, like, okay, could I have his email address? Could I have the uh, details and how, how do I get about? So I sent an email to uh, uh, Mr. Brian Dixon, like like you would send to any other promoters. And yeah. at that point, I was already like, no, like, I'm probably not going to get a response because obviously they get blasted with emails. So it's just that. But then one morning, I, I remember coming home, opening my computer, seeing that I've, I've got an email and it was from Brian Dixon. And he said, like, oh, we've got this six week tour going on. You'd be more than welcome to come, and I would just be calling on my friends. You never guess. Like I was just shaking. Like I would. It, it was basically just for me getting like a big money contract or just uh, I don't know uh, winning a World Cup or something. It was just huge for me because in our circles, like All Star was still it was the place in Europe to go. Yeah. And I know for a fact that like if if Brian if Brian is a busy man, he like he looked at my email, he saw my pictures. If if he proper like went through my matches. It probably wouldn't have happened because I was still such a rookie then. But like I said earlier, like if anybody over over there is like a young trainee listening, invest in yourself. If you look like a star, if you have good gear, that'll open a lot more doors to you than the fact that you know you can do a triple moon salt into a Canadian destroyer. So the fact that Brian liked my pictures, he's still like, okay, this guy's gonna be good for the camp. So he just invited yeah. me over. Oh, amazing. So what was that first like tour in itself like? Who were some of the people you was working with and how did you... Well, obviously it went well because you ended up moving here and you've been here for um, like for the rest of your career, essentially. So what was that first tour like? Well, when you say it went well, it went worked very well in the toilet. It was absolutely abysmal. <laughs> in, a, in a sense, that, that's nothing, no way fault of uh, all stars I mean it was me like I was way over my one of my first matches uh, well my fourth match in the company was a tag team match it was me and Dean Olmark versus Robbie Dynamite and James Mason and for no pressure anybody, yeah if anybody there listening who doesn't know these names you are doing yourself a disfavor of not looking up for these guys like they are absolutely amazing wrestlers and I just remember just being there in the corner seeing Dino start with Robbie and just doing their, you know, stuff they usually do. And I was just glad I wasn't wearing white because I was pissing myself from fear. And I was like, what have I gotten myself into? Like, there's no way I can work with these guys. And, you know, them being nice, they got me through all of everything. Like, I was with them the whole week because, like, in when you're doing the camps, you're with one team for a week. And I was struggling. Like, everybody was giving me more opportunities than I deserved. 
I wasn't the best wrestler. I wasn't even even the the middle wrestler. I was just in way over my head, basically. Yeah. But luckily, the guys were helping me, and even Brian and his daughter Leticia, they were like, they could see that I wanted to do this. That I like, I was like, I even had like a plane ticket to go to go home early because like I was just not up to the par wrestling. But then it just came up an opportunity. Like, hey, how about what? What if you start refereeing? And I was like, I would just jump. It. Like, I would, at that point, I would just wipe the floors in real town hall just to be a part of the team. Yeah. And they let me referee, and that is what made a huge difference for me because I was allowed to be around the guys in the locker room, in the car, in the ring as well, and just learning constantly. And if there's any trainees listening, like you, like refereeing is the best lesson you learn because you're actually in the ring studying it without actually having to interfere yourself and that's what like made made things for me the fact that they let me referee and they let me because i i I remember i had just before i went home for that first tour i was asked to do like okay you you get you can do half like the matches on this day and everybody came after me to say like okay that was night and day like just in these few weeks you've completely changed yeah matured you've learned and that just like made me feel like okay this is where i need to be this is like i have to like start from the bottom i know how to take a basic back bump but rest i need to relearn so i decided as soon as i got home i started looking in like okay and three months later i was living here and i was going to all these schools and i was back on the road with the all-stars refereeing oh that's class like and that's just proof like even when things do get tough like try and muck it out you had enough like respect and i guess balls to stick around as well like when like you said it was you felt it was abysmal and that you couldn't keep up with the likes of them and to be honest i don't i think even people that are in the pram would struggle to keep up with dino robbie and james mason they are just that good so it's like a baptist of fire for you but Surely that's the reason why you're still with All Star. The fact that you're like you came over here to wrestle. You thought actually no, I'll I'll referee. I'll learn more, and then to move over here, even just to start refereeing again. Like full credit to you, because a lot of people, which probably slate the camps because they can't really interact with the crowd well or things like that. They shit on the camp saying, oh well, it's not wrestling or it's not this, it's not that because they couldn't do it. Whereas here you are, so many years later, still part of the roster. I know you had the tag titles with Tyson Taylor. Um, so full credit to you. Like Looking back to where you began to where you've got to now must be a proud feeling. It is definitely like my lifetime achievement. It's the fact that I just refused to quit because when things weren't going my way, like, I, could, I could have easily gone back to being a mediocre fish in like a smaller pond in Finland. Like, just yeah. keep doing that there. But I just refused. Like, Ever since I was 12 years old, I've re- like realized like no matter what happens in life, I will be part of wrestling. So when I came here and had the taste of it, it was yeah. very addicting. And I just realized, okay, I can either make excuses or I can make sacrifices. So I just decided like I will not take a no for not. Like even when I moved over here, yeah. there was no guarantee that Brian would even give me a job again. But I just like decided I'm just gonna have to start from the bottom. Like I no connections, no anything. All I knew was, okay, this, there was this all-star school in Bevington. Uh, later on, the Brookside School in Leicester. There were schools in Leeds. There were schools in St. Helens. I'm just going to get here. I'm just going to train as hard as I can and eventually just basically die try- Like, it, I'm going to make it or die trying. Yeah. Who who was it that you'd been training under then? What were some of the trainers that you'd gone to? Uh, definitely the first big shout out is going to have to be for Mr. John Kenny in St. Helens Infinite Wrestling School if anybody from the All-Star uh, team is listening hey you know hey the legendary is a uh, <laughs> massive influence for me and like my, I feel like he's my granddad in wrestling I have to yeah. give a massive shout out to him he's helped me so much um, I went like I said to Leeds in Brookside School of Wrestling there with Gareth Harris and when Mr. Robbie was there as well uh, in Leeds, I was training with uh, Ligero as well in grapple wrestling. And then whenever I was on the road with All Stars, I was like, okay, we set up the ring. Would you be able to like, you know, give me a little, show me a few things? And I would just buzz around the ring when the guys were like 
teaching each other because yeah. I didn't want to buy in. I don't. I didn't want to be that annoying like apprentice, like <laughs> demanding attention. But I would just constantly just be listening and observing and just asking like, oh, could I do this? And just the fact like of being the referee. I'll say it again. I'll say it a million times. Referee is the best way to learn wrestling. Once you've learned like how to link up, get into refereeing and you will just absorb the information like a sponge. Oh, brilliant. So when did you get the nod to, hey, like you've been refereeing, but we're going to put you back in the ring and give you a shot again? It wasn't a case of like, oh, we're just going to give you a shot. It was more of a case of like, okay, we need a wrestler. And uh, this was somewhere, I think, in spring of 2015. I remember okay. I, was, I was refereeing a tag team match in Bognor Regis Butlins, and one of the guys, uh, he got injured. There was just a little mishap in the ring, nothing serious, but like he was like, okay, I can't be, like, I'd rather referee for the next because we were on tour. I'd rather just referee for a few days. Yeah. So I got into, like, they were just trying to, like, hide me and, like, put me in, like, a multiple man ladder matches or multiple man matches where I wouldn't have to be exposed. Yeah. But it was on, I still can't remember what, what day it was, but I remember it was in springtime 2015. I, I woke up in the morning and I got a few missed calls from Brian and the other guys and like, hey, are you available today? Uh, we got a show in uh, in Devon Cliffs. And I got like, at the time I didn't drive and I've never told this story to anybody, but I actually just called, called a taxi and took a taxi to the, our usual meet, which cost me like 50 quid. Because, <laughs> because I didn't want to turn them down. So like, okay, like I, they need a guy. I want to make myself available. I want, want them to know that they can rely on me. And we did what was a camp showcase, which was basically we wrestled in front of the fun stars in Haven Holiday Camps, just so that, you know, they'll know that, okay, this is going to be happening during yeah. the summer. You're going to be emceeing. So this is what's going to be happening. And I remember they put me in a match with, uh, it was me, uh, Joel Redman, James Mason, and Caden Lay. And they got through, they got me through it, like all credit to them. It was, it was all them. But at the same time, I think they've kind of taken a liking to me at the mo- moment, just for the fact that I wouldn't quit. They wouldn't admit to my face, like even to this day, James is not going to say a nice thing about me. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the fact that like my matches are boring because I don't mess up anymore. But... We got through it, and Brian saw, okay, like, he, he can rely on me as a wrestler, and, you know, he'd rather have me on rather as a wrestler because of the way I looked, and that he could use somebody else as a referee. And I got my foot in the door, and I, I still, every now and then, whenever, like, he needed a referee, I would happily put the stripes on. Yeah. But, and I would still do it, but over the years, just more and more and more, it just became a more... I became a more re- reliable as a wrestler, I would say, and it was just on the job training. And I'm, I still feel like I am the apprentice. I still feel like I'm a bumbling, bumbling idiot. But at the <laughs> time, the rare compliments from the promoters saying, like, "I'm going to put it, put you on with Eccentrico. He's been here for a long time. He'll get you through." So now I'm sort of in the position that I used to be in, and I just feel that. That, that, that's something I feel very proud of, the fact yeah. that like they have the trust in me and so that I can help others because I got a lot of help. So I will have all the time in the world for people who are coming to ask for help just to re- repay the debt I feel like the wrestling community has told in total. Yeah, definitely. And um, like for those that may not be familiar with all Star schedule, like how many matches a year roughly are you working now? Because it does tend to be in the triple figures. It, like... Ever since I moved here in 2014, I've been working close to 200 shows a year at least. Yeah. And there's often there's doubles that you might you might wrestle three times in one show. So going from maybe one one show a month in Finland to 200 shows a year is the, well the main reason I moved over here because you yeah. you get that exposure you get that work. I remember 2019 I did like a calculation that I did. It was either 72 or 82 matches in like 10 weeks. I counted like 12 matches in one week uh, on one knee as well and all the traveling as well. So the scheduling or the schedule is horrid at at the point sometimes. But because the team is so great and we just feel like we're brothers and sisters there, it's like it's almost like the wrestling is like the worst part in a sense. Like we just want to spend time with each other and just 
so in the travel lodge telling stories and just enjoying each other's company so it's very much when you hear the classic it's, it's a cliche when you like love what you do it doesn't feel like work so that's definitely the case with me and all this horrible uh, schedule but at the yeah. same time the lockdown has worked and the benefits because like i haven't stopped in five years to actually have time off and sleep and recover <laughs> i'm silver lining i'm gracious for that as well yeah definitely and um, everybody always talks about like the atmosphere with the boys and stuff and that's that's the thing they miss the most is it's not wrestling that many times it is being on the road with the boys in my interview it's it'll be released by the time this one's released but it's not being released as we're recording with tyson taylor he mentioned sometimes you get like a lot of the people coming from america and they're like oh yeah we've We've heard from like Jericho or Daniel, Brian Danielson or Cash Wheeler that it's it's great. Like we need to come on it, and they just physically can't do it because it is grueling. Because you'll go, you'll set up, you put the ring up, you may re- wrestle, take it down, go again. And when you're wrestling three times a day and being the ring crew, it is very grueling for people that are only used to working maybe once a week. It is definitely a culture shock, and. Even like the, the British guys, when they come on the team, who might have like heard or might not know a bit better what it's like to work the camps, it's also like a little bit of a surprise for them as well. But because you kind of like, we don't have the time or the energy to like babysit anybody, which is like, what well, like one of the things like I made an absolute like fool of myself when I was starting as well is because I didn't know certain things, I didn't know certain protocols, I didn't know certain ed- etiquette things. It's not like they're expected of you, but you're like the just main rule rule is just don't be a nuisance. Yeah. And if you're the guy who's like always the late, the less in the car or taking forever when we're getting a food shop or just the fact that like you just decide like, oh, I'm going to wash my gear tomorrow instead of today. And then you realize, oh, you didn't have time to wash your gear. And you're the guy with the smelly knee pads. It's just like almost a real life boot camp. And it's like, okay, this is shock of reality of learning to just live outside of a bag and being like having your own little space in that really really like three people to a ho- hotel room and you are just okay learn to be uh, coexist with these guys that you've never met before and yeah it's it's definitely like a dose of reality that i think everybody needs at times just to realize you know keep, keep your ego in check when you have to like get changed in like small cover and there's no toilet and you haven't been able to go for a wee in like two hours and you have to go and wrestle so it's not always glamorous, and it's definitely sh- it should not be because those are the fun times. When, that's that's when the stories come in when you're in the trenches like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so before we get onto like some more like your yeah, like best moments with All Star, then um, you mentioned Infinite. Um, you mentioned First Wrestling. Like, what companies have you been working for during your time over here aside from um, All Star? So I've been with uh like like I, like you said infinite wrestling i've been up been with uh uh ngw I've, I've been with first class wrestling i've been with epw and and a lot of companies that are now defunct i think like there was one that i did called monkey madness wrestling which was yeah. a very interesting experience was that around the where was that based it seems quite local to myself Somewhere in like the Leeds, Yorkshire, yeah. area, like it was, it was a funny little working men's club. And the one of the, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's a problem or anything, but like, because I'm so busy with the All Star wrestling schedule, yeah. so trying to uh, arrange bookings with other companies. And then once, like, oh, they have an op- opening, but I don't have an opening. And then they book in advance, but then, oh, it turns out like it's ha- like I have to do like, would I rather take one show for these guys, even though I'd love to work whatever company it is, or would I take three shows with all stars for a weekend? So uh, as much as experience that I've had, as many of matches I've had, I, the amount of companies I've worked for isn't that big. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Cause again, like you said, and I think it's sim with Dean mentioned it in my chat with him where he's not being one that goes out to ask for opportunities because He's been doing it for 20 years, full-time working for All-Star. Like, he's not... The, the schedule's there. And that's why it just baffles me when fans or even wrestlers that don't work for All-Star kind of shit on All-Star or any of the camp runs because, like, 
in one summer, you're going to work more than they have for the past couple of years. Yeah, and that's one of the re- like when when you asked me to be on this podcast, it was like surprising because uh, like obviously I come, you've had recommendations from my friends, but I don't think a lot of people know who I am, and like I I don't use social media much. I may, maybe like a hundred Twitter followers, yeah. but then when you compare my schedule to some of the guys who are like popular, like I might do two hundred shows in that year and nobody knows it. Whereas, like, if I have one show a month and everybody knows it, so it's a bit of a give and take. But to me, I think I would like. I've never done this for the fact that like I want to be a famous or I want to get that recognition. Just for the fact that like uh, some of the, like the guys I work for and respect, they say like, "Oh, it's a pleasure to go on with you." Yeah. That's in, or even the fact like you know, Key and all those guys have said like, "Oh, you need to get Accenture go on your program." That's just. That, to me, that that's more important than selling out a huge show or just winning some big, big, big championship. Yeah, definitely. And I think, like, I think that's why I enjoy this sort of content that I'm doing. Whether it's um, trying to put a spotlight on the all star guys that don't get the recognition um, that they deserve, or with all these. I know, again, we've mentioned with the Scandinavian stuff, or I've been looking in um, Southeast Asia, in like the Philippines, Malaysia, Taiwan, and China, and all these other places, just to try and spotlight like wrestling scenes or different wrestlers that don't get the credit they deserve. And I think, again, that's why I really enjoy doing this All Star stuff because everybody that I speak to from All Star, it is working 200 matches a year, give or take, and it's people then you, you deserve the credit i know you're not doing it for the fame but i still believe like you guys still deserve the credit you deserve because you've you've put the but you've put the work in and if all your matches were recorded like the body of work that you'd have like have to show would piss on like half the wrestling scene here yeah i really appreciate you saying that and like i've always tried to like kick myself in, in the behind like okay get more active on social media film your matches but then when you're doing all that you, you can't always get the camera in position so you yeah. like if i was to post like okay i wrestled this this and this this and this so it would be quite boring because like like when we're doing the campsites they you might wrestle the same guy the whole week because there's only like seven guys on the team anyway so the results might be a bit like people might be like hang on they're doing some kind of a angle with this, like a best of seven series or whatever it is <laughs> But when, like, when you said about doing this pod- podcast and everything, when I see like the guest list oh, you've had, like, you know, Key and Kelly and Jim Diehard and Screwface, it's like it, that made me like this. The interviews were great, but that made me more happy than the fact that you know these guys definitely deserve the spotlight. And just to be like, you know, these guys deserve the spotlight. They're amazing workers, and more people should know about them. So, it's like, yeah. when you say you appreciate us being on the show, we definitely appreciate us having you on the show. That's- oh no. I think I said that correctly. Anybody anybody who knows English grammar, get off it. It's my third language. Come on. <laughs> go easy on me. You appreciate me having you on the show. I think yeah, that's what you was getting at. <laughs> thank you, you I, translate. I, I, I couldn't remember which one you said, and I was like, wait, is is that right? Or uh, did I hear that wrong? Or I was as confused if you got it right or wrong as you were, so don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, but we we got there in the end. It, it was like <laughs> like my first match, just like it, it was a mess in the middle, but we got the the uh, decided ending. <laughs> we, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, so when you do look at like that body of work, again, you got the tag titles with um, Tyson Taylor, What's it been like teaming with Tyson? Like, it's it, it feels weird because it doesn't feel like a, like we're even working. It's just the fact that like he like him and Dino like we're just like this little like when we were traveling, it's just like us us boys, and it's just yeah we're basically just trying to like outdo each other in in the ways of like making each other laugh and just having such a good time and just like little small things. With Tyson, it's just always a pleasure in a, in a sense like okay let's just when you when i see the name on the bill it's like okay it's going to be fun like i'm i know i'm going to be like the match is going to be least of my worries so to have that confidence and trust in somebody and the fact that you know you're going to have a good time you're going to laugh you're going to enjoy the time on the road that just makes it all worth it yeah definitely so thinking back then like what other 
um, matches or experience with all stars, uh, ones that you look back on fondly that won't get you in trouble. Yeah, I'm glad you said, <laughs> you said that. Like mo- most of the stuff that I tell, it's gonna have to be like like even outside the ring, like always anonymous. Like I, I like, oh, probably shouldn't have said that, but it's just. I think one of the fondest memories, I know it's not directly All-Star, but it's very All-Star related. It was, um, I think it was in 2015, First Class Wrestling, uh, every June, they do a charity show for Meningitis Now in Northwich. Uh, there's a pub called Lee Arms, there's a, like a wrestling ring outside there. And the guys are all, all, all All-Star boys, and whoever, like whoever's on the show, like there's there's no bad apples in that punch. Everybody has to get along with each other and everybody has to be a decent hand in the ring. Yeah. So when I was first invited there, it was like, oh, I must be doing something right. Like these guys are like, may- maybe there, there is something to all, all this sacrifice or maybe I am getting somewhere. And just like to make like still Key and Kelly's gimmick of mentioning James Mason 17 times in a podcast. When he comes up, when I was like jokingly said, like, oh, did you watch the match? And so, like, when he says to me, I don't watch your matches anymore because they're safe, they're not train wrecks anymore, that it was, that makes me feel proud. And then one of the most recent ones that I had with uh, just before the lockdown, um, the, a guy you just had on your podcast, Sheikh Al Sham, I'm sorry if yeah. I'm butchering his name, who definitely deserves all the credit and all, all the spotlight because he's going to be huge one day. Uh, I wrestled him, and it was one of those situations that there was wires going across. But I thought I was going to be wrestling a guy called Dylan Roberts, but as the intro music was playing for the show, uh, the promoter comes in like, oh, hang on, you're wrestling him. And as my music was playing, oh, shake, it's going to be your, me and you. I'll see you out there, kid. And we got through it, and obviously all credit to him as well. But the fact yeah. that I could just go in there, just shoved in, and it just goes and I can, I can do the job like if that was like okay maybe i'm not as bad as i as i still I'm, maybe i'm not the uh bumbling apprentice anymore maybe i've like li- reached to like uh like slightly like get a green belt like in karate or whatever that was, <laughs> those things are but just the small personal victories yeah definitely and i think um it, it's it's funny because you all have the similar mentality um again with Going back to the Tyson interview, he'd mentioned um, like his favorite matches are the ones where he doesn't like to work and then they get better. So he was telling where him and Spitty wouldn't really um, connect well. But then one of the matches they had, it actually went quite well. And I was like, actually, that was quite good. And he prefers that than the matches that he's torn the house down. So it's a bit similar to yourself when you're facing Sheikh Al Sham and you weren't expecting it to go out there to get through it and deliver it. Surely that's, again, a good feeling for yourself because you know you're capable of just calling it in the ring with anybody. Yeah, and that's definitely the, for me, like the peer uh, recognition is a huge thing for me in a sense because I have so much respect. Like you mentioned Spitty, Tony Spitfire, who was a guy who, like, you, you should do like a series of podcasts with him because he's got that, that many stories. And because he's helped me so much and he's like, I've had loads of matches with him and he's pulled me through, he's taught me. He's just, he, he's a guy I, I still like almost am intimidated by because I have so much respect for him. Yeah. But when, when he comes to me and says, like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it, when I see I'm, like I'm on with, on with Dexenchko, it's going to be nice. I, I appreciate being in the ring with you. That to me is more important to like doing a sellout show and so just the fact that these guys who respect me expect accept me as one of their own and just like gives me that sort of like recognition. That fit makes me feel like all of this like all like it's it's not been easy like these yeah. past twelve years. Just like to feel like I'm on the right path. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's the most important thing is to like focus on what your peers think and what the promoter thinks rather than what the fans on social media think. I think Tyson Duke said it best on Twitter recently where he mentioned like the amount of people that go to see if the fans liked it and don't even ask the promoter of, hey, was that okay? Did you enjoy it? And things like that is a big like cry for shame. Like it's it is the people that you're working with that matters and their opinions. And it's always like, what's, what's your thought process on, on it all regarding like feedback? Cause you were struggling 
and you want it to know what you can improve on, whereas a lot of people only like to hear what they're good at rather than what they can improve on. I think everybody like needs to be told that you know you were rotten. Just just to like a reminder of like you are human. And with me, like like we've discussed, like a very good description was that you know there was not enough thumbs in the world. Some people will, will get their reference that I was absolutely wrong. But the fact that I was able to take that and, and like accept it, but also work through it, that's something that I think tells a lot about, you know, the character. I, like, not to G myself up, but like the guys yeah. in the All Stars, they nowadays, when we're having like these sessions in the travel lodges, they tell, like, they've got this respect for me in, in a sense that, like, I was abysmal and like, there was like I don't I don't want to make make people think I don't think there's any bullying going on in like All Star Wrestling but there were like obviously when I was a new kid and I, I know myself I was when I moved over I was still a kid I had a lot to growing up to do and I wasn't like I didn't have to do it out of malice but it was just because I didn't know any better so I did yeah. a lot of stupid stuff so they would like also like like haze me a little bit on it and they would also look, test my character because if I'm on the team that could mean that friends back home doing nothing so they want to make sure I'm worth it and the fact that I like I stuck through it like I refused the fact that like there's no like I'm horrible but the fact that I want to work better I rec- and it, one of the things like uh, Mick Limerick oh every time I hang out with him and he's had a few beers he we always have the same conversation in the fact that because I am completely straight edge I've never had a drop of alcohol and he always tells like there's just like this respect that I can still socialize with the boys i'll stay out with the boys until seven o'clock in the morning i just choose not to drink yeah so the fact that you know you're able to like take the little like the negativity is like no but like if you're born perfect like that's well that that's it like you know your life's over like there's no more growth to be done yeah so i would rather have the mentality of a master failing more times than the apprentice has tried yeah so if people go and just like look for that positive reinforcement, which is obviously there's a way to get criticism. Like I, I, I don't want to be the guy person like, okay, you were rotten, like sell your boots. That's the only way you make money yeah. in wrestling. I don't want to be that guy. But it also like, if you don't accept help or don't want help, like it has to come from you. Like otherwise you're not going to receive the help. You can try to be as nice as you can. Like I'll help a lot of people to make my job easier because if you are good, and then and we get along then that that works great but if you refuse to accept any help like i'll just like okay you know let, let, i'll just get through it and it will know with this is just going to be it but if you actively like come in like i'm not saying i have all the answers i just have my personal views on stuff but if you come in and ask for help people will have time for you maybe not that very instant because they might be busy something else and don't take that too hard yeah. but if you showcase the right attitude and actually come in and say like hey could you please help me you will get help and that will like that will get you a lot further than go and say like oh yeah everybody loves me everybody thinks i'm great which are characters we i think like i say that with certain people in mind i know you've got certain people in mind when just when i say that like just feeling that you are a work in progress is part of the fun actually just being yeah. better and looking back at your old match like oh i can't believe i used to do that so sometimes you just need to be told that you were absolute crap and just never do that again and that's the way you learn yeah definitely like and again if like other content creators are listening um it was a bit like with the speaking like it public speaking or interviewing it doesn't always come natural like i always remember my first public speaking would have been about mental health and in front of hundreds of people but when i was doing the training for that i was fucking shit and it was always bumbling on words or the nerves taking over and you start from from that day i always like right what can i improve on what can i improve on what can i improve on and it was the same with that it was the same when i was being a football coach anything that always ask for what you can improve on because if you if if you're great it's it's great to get compliments don't get me wrong it's great to get the recognition but if you're only getting told what you're good at then you're going to continue doing this stuff that you're bad at so try and ask for that like look what what can i improve on and um it's it's good to see that like yourself and i think again with going back to tyson where 
he referred to himself as the drizzling shits when he first started. And it's it's good to see that you both had that tag titles as well because you've both had that similar story where you've gone in and you just weren't ready for it, but you've both persevered and maybe took some of the hazing and the banter and stuff and you've kept pushing forward to now being both mainstays of the all-star scene. Yeah, definitely. Like there's the old saying, like I'm not very good on my British proverbs, but that like uh, uh, comfort breeds contempt or whatever. Like when you get comfortable, you get lazy. Yeah. And like with this lockdown as well, like I've pushed myself in, when we discussed about mental health, like you mentioned there very briefly, I've started to work on myself as well. I've been doing this thing called CBT, which is cognitive yeah. behavioral therapy. For those of you who are, know about mental health issues, and it is so hard and you have to like keep pushing yourself but i know like after eight weeks there has been a lot of progress like you can only grow if you go out of your comfort zone yeah definitely and like props to you for mentioning that like people speaking about the mental health it's to some it's still like a taboo subject i think people need to um talk about it more and it's i always find it great when um, wrestlers mention that they've needed support for various mental health like obviously it's horrible that you're going through it but with the way re- wrestling fans can be and the social media can be so toxic it's it's needed to be reminded that these aren't just actors like it's it's not as if you're watching a film and saying oh, i fucking hate james bond a lot of the time you, you direct it to the person behind the character in wrestling and I think it's just important for people that are struggling, especially during um, these circumstances. I know the pandemic's gone on way longer than a lot of people thought it would, and it's been difficult to try and have a look at C- CBT. I know I've sent a lot of my customers in my shoot job like to go get that support. I've done counselling myself, and actually sponsoring the show is uh, Blokes. You can find that in like the description, and that's a forum where you can go on and speak to like-minded people you can do it anonymously and i think that's just a great way i am i know blokes they're getting involved in wrestle carnival so it will be a support for whether it's fans or if it's for wrestlers to have a look at that avenue like you need to look after your mental health just as much as your physical oh absolutely like that, that is where i struggle a lot more than physically side so. But that's kind of like what I hope, like with the mask as well, it has like the symbolism of like, I'm very like in a private sense, I'm very bad at like communicating with people. And I like, even on this podcast or on social media, I don't, in, when I'm in the quote unquote public eye, I'm not swearing. Like you've, you've had dropped a few F-bombs there, but when I'm this person, when I'm eccentric, I'm like very PG outside. I'm, there's differences. Like I'm a multi, multi-layered person. Like we all are onions, but what I'm trying to say is like what I'm hoping with the mask as well. Like I've gone through a lot of struggles. I've had uh, like with mental health. Like I I, I wasn't pl- planning on discussing because I don't really usually talk about this public. But you know, s- screw it. Like I've had uh, depression and anxiety for all, over a decade, and for to be in this kind of a job that we are in wrestling, like having uh, like a horrible self-esteem and all those issues, you wouldn't expect that. Like I'm the least confident wrestler you probably would actually meet if if I didn't have this. Uh, persona in front of you but that's kind of what I'm hoping with the mask as well having the symbol like if I can overcome it like it could be anybody underneath this mask so even like no matter what you're going through you can always like there is always a way out you can overcome a lot of things like I have been in the darkest of depths and to a certain extent I am glad I've been there because it made me grow as a person and if I can do it if a bumbling idiot from Finland can do it so can you like that's it. i know it's a very cliche thing to say but like i i fully believe as as human beings have the potential to change our life for the better and it but it has to come from you and it has to be you who does the job but if i can be a representative for that one like okay it's just because you're depressed and exa- have anxiety it doesn't mean you make you any worse of a human being but you can also always get over it over yourself if you are willing to do the work yeah definitely and again just i i hate the fact that people do dismiss mental health like how i see it if you for example you've had your surgery so you're doing your physio and you're taking your painkillers treat that if, if you're having to do cbt or counseling or if you are having to do medication um 
just treat it as like the medication is the painkillers and the CBT or counselling, that's your physio and it's it's important just to um, try and look after yourself. So by all means, like have a look at blokes or if, if somebody's listening to this and felt like they needed to talk, feel free to message myself. Like over the past couple of years, I've been very vocal about my struggles with mental health and the suicide tendencies and slowly getting away from that. And I appreciate you opening up like on the show, like you mentioned, you don't really speak about that. So the fact that you've actually openly said that is is a massive help and um i think it's it's very brave of yourself for being in such a position so props to you for that thank you and like i always think like with at least in my personal experience your issues are a lot like in more inside your like you you're thinking things that are worse than they actually are yeah and when like I, I just want to like encourage people like I know it's very difficult to ask for help to be vulnerable and just approach even if it's just anonymously but you'll thank yourself in the end because like I mentioned 2019 at the camp run was really fun but I was in a bad place mentally and I didn't speak to anybody and I was being grumpy and I was like looking back like I was having the time of my life and I was the person blocking myself from ha- having the fun I don't want to be that guy so it took me like being in that position or that a dark place to realize I don't want to do this anymore so I, that's why I reached out and for me that CBT therapy has helped a lot so anybody listening if there is any like I have experience like I'll, I'll try to help. I'm not obviously I'm, I'm not professionally qualified but if you need any recommendation based on personal ex- experience my DMs are open as well and I will gladly like if anybody could get the help that they they need or think they need that would be amazing yeah, this, definitely. You're, you're always going to be your own worst enemy in that sense, and like, don't let your negative thoughts control or defeat you. Hundred um, percent. So to try and like change it to more of a lighter note, I guess. Um, like, what what is left for yourself? Like, what are the goals that when you're thinking of right, this is what I want to maybe accomplish. Is is there anything that you want to do or are you content in what you're doing so far with All-Star? Well, first of all, my, my last match was against Tyson Taylor and I can't let that be my last match. In any... <laughs> <laughs> Just a little rib on him. But um, I think that has changed with me over the years. Like when I was, like everybody when they were younger, I wanted to get to WWE. I want, I want to be the big star. Like I want to, like, because we've seen that on TV. I had a WWE try in 2017. That was a nice experience. But now as, as I've matured, I don't think that there's actually like any concrete thing that I have to do or want to do. Yeah. I just like also based on like that discovery from like, like from my mental health, I just want to be happy. I just want to have fun. So if it means like I'm doing small shows in front of like 20 people, but I, I get to wrestle my best friends, that's fine. If I get to go do on the camp runs, which I absolutely love, that's fine as well. I just want to have a good time. Like we have a limited time. You get one life, one chance. You have limited time. I, I'm getting older. I'm <laughs> years old. <laughs> I'm, I'm running out of time in a sense. So I want to enjoy as much as I can while my knees are still get, like in uh, relatively good condition, while my body <laughs> is still able to take the bumps. I just want to have as much fun as I want I can. Uh, experience, have all these crazy experiences, see all these places and just live this uh, little dream that I had when I was 12 years old. Obviously, I don't have a fancy car. I live in a in a somewhat okay apartment, but then again, possession's not everything. Just, I'd rather have a thousand memories than a thousand pounds. Yeah, definitely. Um, what was that WWE tryout like then back in 2017? Uh, it was surreal in a sense because that was something that i thought would never happen yeah and but at the same time like i really enjoyed it like uh obviously like they drill you like man they, yeah they, the whole idea there is to blow you up uh but that was another personal victory like i felt like oh i've uh i've i got through it like you know i, I didn't die as much as i, I thought i would <laughs> but again th- there's the, the little credit goes there I, I forgot to mention it earlier i'm terribly sorry about that but like marty jones i've trained with him as well and obviously he knew knows a lot of stuff there so he's helped me so having the help from there as well just the fact that i was able to get through it that was great and yeah. just to see like you know 
be inside that little ring. Uh, I had never, like, because of just the attitude I have towards myself, like, I never expected anything great to be. Like, if anything, like, I was just like, I'm just going to go in there. This is going to be an experience. I'm going to make the best of it. If something comes out of it, that's great. Yeah. And they did, like, like enjoy me there. Like, they, I got very positive feedback. I got to speak with some of the executives and not to go into much full, much detail, but the fact with, like, you know, having a Finnish background and with NXT UK, unfortunately, uh, nothing ever came out of it. But I yeah. don't... I, I don't hold a grudge. I don't feel upset about anything. If they came calling again, you know, that's that's great. That'd be great. I wouldn't turn them down. But at the same time, uh, I don't feel like a failure that I didn't get through. Uh, just the fact that, like, I was in the position. I yeah. was like, okay, I, I, I have another memory in, in the in the bank that I'll keep with me forever. And that's pretty much all I wanted. Definitely. And I think you'd have been one of the first Scandinavian um, like wrestlers to even be in that position on the tryouts and if they if they did come knocking or offer you a tryout like because i know there was a lot of talks that there was looking to be more regular and um, before the pandemic happened looking at more venues uh increasing the roster and stuff like that so if they were to offer you another tryout and wanted to bring you in for some stuff is that would would you consider that if it meant going full-time with wwe I definitely wouldn't say no. It, I mean, it would be hard in a sense because I would I would miss like you know being on the road with with the boys in the beast. Yeah. And like I don't know if like the professionals like super ultra professional like their squeaky clean wrestling is would be as fun. But... <laughs> also, because like the, the the road stores and stuff would be very different. Yeah. I imagine. <laughs> Uh, but let, let, let's keep it PG and let's not throw anybody at <laughs> the bus going those road stories. But yeah, but I would definitely, I would like to experience it. I, I mean, it would be a learning experience. It, it would, like, I like putting myself into new positions in a sense that, like, I've done the camp style. I've gotten comfortable enough to, like, okay, I can feel I can do the camp stuff. I can do family shows. I can, yeah. I can do these more internet fan base shows. And then there, there's a new style to learn. And again, learning challenging myself stepping out of that comfort zone i would i would probably relish it i yeah. don't know if like even if it would be just for one show i, I could at least say like hey i've done it i mean it, it was fun yeah definitely oh no brilliant like i could carry on talking like forever so we'll definitely have to do one again like in the future especially when wrestling's back to normal the knees a lot better i'm hoping to do some like all star themed round tables where i'll get a few people on at the same time because i think that'll be um a lot of fun like hopefully i'll actually be able to use some of the content um hopefully I mean, as can... long as we're not in a travel lodge with a case of cause you know then you should be fine <laughs> definitely um but where where can people find you on your different social media platforms I know I'm not the super most active person, but on Facebook, Twitter, so, uh, Instagram, I'm Eccentrico Lucha. It's Echo, X-Ray, Charlie, Echo, November, Tango, Romeo, India, Charlie, Oscar, Lima, Uniform, Charlie, Hotel Alpha. I made sure I practiced that before I came on this show. Uh, <laughs> I also have an online shop that hasn't been active at all, I've, like the eccentrico.bigcartel.com. There's a couple of T-shirts, a couple of uh, replicas still left there. Not much there. <laughs> Because I've been a bit lazy, I felt like being in the pandemic. That's not priority number one. Yeah. But in any of those places, uh, just contact me. I, I appreciate any shout outs. Uh, send me pictures of your pet. That's always fun. And <laughs> also, speaking of sending stuff, uh, if you're on Twitter, find Caden Lay and please whoever's listening to send him pictures of clowns because he's terrified of them and he probably won't listen to this podcast. So if random people start sending him pictures of clowns. That will make my day, and just and just rib him like that. So yeah, anything. Just have a have a chat with me. Like we're all in the pandemic, and we we've got nothing to do. So my DMs are open. Oh, brilliant! Um, so yeah, do go check him out and go follow on social media. Eccentrico, like, thank you for coming on the show. Like, it's been really, it's been a lot of fun talking oh, to yeah. you. I was abs- I can tell you straight away. I was terrified when I was like, "Oh, I'm going to be doing this." This is my first podcast. I was nervous, but it was been a lot of fun. Thank you for making me feel comfortable, and thanks for everybody who's been giving you the. Uh, you know who you are. Who's been telling you to put me on the show? 
no brilliant um so everybody do go follow eccentrico again um make sure you head over to the merch stand i've just released like my own merchandise you've got the plain logo tees the international wrestling podcast tees and also the hashtag scandigraps range so go to the merch stand that also brings you guys in uh, worldwide so you can get this sort of product as well um so head over and try and support guys in worldwide over on the merch stand make sure you hit like make sure you hit subscribe thank you for watching thank you for listening more